Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Imagine facing a life-threatening disease with no known cure. Now imagine that you're a physician and the person facing the disease is you. That's the story David Fagenbaum tells in his memoir, Chasing My Cure, a doctor's race to turn hope into action. A quarterback at Georgetown, David was in medical school studying to become an oncologist when his life dramatically changed. He began suffering from fatigue and in a matter of weeks, his organs began to fail. Miraculously, David survived, only to endure repeated near-death relapses from what would eventually be diagnosed as Castleman's disease. Faced with the unthinkable, David realized that the best person to find a cure might be himself. Today's conversation is a story about what David calls invincible hope. It's about turning hope into action and creating your own silver lining. Here is one awesome conversation with a remarkable human being, David Fagenbaum. David Fagenbaum, what a treat to have you on. Thanks so much for taking a minute. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So let's start with your life before you got sick. What were your hopes and dreams sort of at that time? So I... uh had always wanted to go into medicine. I was always interested in medicine. Um, and that interest turned into a life's mission when my mom was diagnosed with cancer while I was a freshman in college, watching her battle, the way that she fought it so bravely and the way her physicians helped her, um, really inspired me to want to dedicate my life, uh, to, to becoming a physician. My mom passed away in uh, my sophomore year of college and I, struggled so much with her passing, um, but I knew that the only thing that I could do or, or, was to try to, to honor her memory by going into medicine. And so I, I ended up uh, finishing up my pre-med curriculum and heading off to, to medical school here at UPenn um, with the mission of becoming an oncologist. I wanted to, to treat uh, cancer patients in memory of my mom. When and how did it all change? Like, take us to the point in time that you realized that something wasn't right? I was totally healthy, and it was my third year of medical school. I was treating patients and uh, was kind of, I was where I, I wanted to be. I was so thrilled. I was kind of back on top after going through such a tough time after my mom's passing, um, pursuing that that dream that I, I, I had um, vocalized to my mom before her passing. When I just noticed that I was feeling more tired than usual, I noticed that um, I was having kind of lumps appearing in my neck. Uh, I noticed fluid pooling in my legs, and I was a very healthy person before, and I actually played college football, and I'd never had any medical problems, so these were really unusual, and as a medical student, I, I knew that there was something serious going on. I didn't know what, but I certainly knew that, that these unusual things um, should be concerning, um, but I had a really important medical school exam that I wanted to get through, and so I kind of tried to deal with the symptoms and deal with the pain, the fatigue, um, and eventually I, I finished. So I, I took my medical school exam, and then I I kind of limped down the hall to the emergency department in the same hospital I just taken my exam. And they did blood work, and they said, "David, your liver, your kidneys, and your bone marrow are shutting down. We have to hospitalize you right away." And unfortunately, I became very, very, very sick. They had to transfer me to the intensive care unit. I had a retinal hemorrhage, which made me blind in my left eye. I ended up gaining about 70 pounds of fluid and drifted in and out of consciousness all without a diagnosis. And, and so within two weeks, your body is going uh, undergoing this rapid transformation for a really healthy guy who humbly was the quarterback at Georgetown, by the way. And, and so what was happening? Basically, my immune system was attacking all of my vital organs. Uh, for an unknown cause. Uh, we, at the time, we didn't know what the disease even was. We just knew that whatever it was, it was bad. And um, unfortunately, it ended up taking about 11 weeks 
to get the diagnosis. And, and I guess I should say, fortunately, it happened when it happened, because by the time the diagnosis was made, I was so ill that my doctors had informed my family that it was time to say their goodbyes. And a priest came into my room to administer my last rites to me. Mm. So thankfully, the diagnosis was made. And thankfully, with the diagnosis, they were able to start me on chemotherapy. Uh, and that is what saved my life. And so, so I was eventually diagnosed with what's called idiopathic multicentric Castleman disease, this rare immune system disorder where the immune system attacks your vital organ for an unknown cause. And unfortunately, because it's so poorly understood, chemotherapy was really the only option at the time. But thankfully, chemotherapy worked uh, to, to keep me alive, although I would, I would go on to have a number of, of relapses. You know, you, you went a long time, as you just said, without a diagnosis. And so I, I just wanted to ask, like, as you look back, what, what did you learn about that experience, about sort of operating inside of such uncertainty and, and such literally a life and death sort of level of uncertainty that had to have been obviously incredibly difficult? It was so difficult. I think the, the, the number one thing that I learned, so previously I, I had watched my, my mom's illness as, as the loved one. And um, I remember how difficult and kind of helpless you feel um, when you have a loved one who's ill. And all of a sudden I was now the, the patient and I was watching my dad and my sisters, uh, my friends uh, around me. And, and I think that one thing I did learn um, is just how powerful support is and how important it is to have the people around you that, that, that love you to be just physically present with you. That support is hard to describe and hard to, to measure. Uh, I think the other thing that I, I, I don't think I was expecting was how important humor can actually be during really <laughs> tough times. You know, mm. you think that when you're like dying in the ICU with multi-organ failure, that like the last thing you would think about is humor, but actually sometimes humor is like the only thing you have during these really, really tense moments. And there are a number of uh, experiences and examples where humor was kind of exactly what we needed um, to get us through to the next day. Mm. Well, what can you share one? Sure, absolutely. So the the first one that immediately comes to mind was that I'm finally diagnosed with idiopathic MCD. I'm treated with chemotherapy. I get out of the hospital, and then I relapsed shortly thereafter. And this time, I needed multi agent chemotherapy, so a combination of seven chemotherapies all at once that started to finally treat my disease. And actually, I was so sick, I I felt better with every dose of chemotherapy. But with chemotherapy, it meant that I lost all of my hair. And I mentioned earlier that I had fluid all over my body, so I had this huge belly from the liver and kidney failure. And it was after spending at this stage almost five months hospitalized, I was finally feeling well enough to, to, to get up and start going for walks. And so it was New Year's Eve of 2010, and my dad and I went for a walk that evening at about 8 p.m. And as we passed the family waiting area, we noticed that there was a gentleman who looked like he'd been drinking on New Year's Eve. He was kind of like swaying in his chair. And on our next lap around the floor, we saw that he had fallen onto the ground. And so my dad ran over and helped him back into his chair. He turned to my dad and I, and he said, thanks so much. Good luck to you and your wife. We're like, wife? What are you talking about? <laughs> then I looked at my belly, and I realized he thought I was my dad's <laughs> pregnant wife. <laughs> and the two of us just burst into laughter. Uh -huh, I mean, you think about, sure. you know, this is a drunk man thinking I'm my dad's pregnant wife. And, and you know, we're walking laps so we sure. can deliver our, our baby. You know, that, that's a, 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 that, that could have been a real low point. For both sure, of us. sure. <laughs> for both of us. But what we found is that actually, you know, laughing together. I mean, yeah, I did kind of look like, you know, a, a, a pregnant woman. And then maybe I was you know, walking to deliver a baby, that, that, that certainly was not the case. <laughs> you know, finding humor in the midst of, of tough times like that really helped us. Just, just laughing together with the people that you love um, can sometimes make those challenges not so difficult. Yeah, that is a great story. That's a great story. And, and on your website, for the folks that are listening, you can see that photo, and it uh, looked like um, you were. It's just, it's, a, it's an incredible photo when you look at you now, um, certainly. So, David, you went from, you know, a physician, you know, caretaker, right, <laughs> to a patient. Yeah. What are some ways that your perspective changed inside of that shift? So, my, my perspective changed so much. I, I think that, um, and in so many ways, I think that one immediate 
perspective change um, that I had was that as a physician in training, um, you get this sense that you think that you actually get to spend more time collectively with each of your patients than you actually do. When you're the patient, you realize just how many other healthcare providers there are who, who spend so much more time um, with the patient than, than the physician gets to. So I think that a incredible appreciation for all of the other healthcare professionals um, that, that make healthcare what it is in the United States, um, that, that's certainly one. Uh, another is that as a healthcare provider and as a physician and as a researcher, I, I really um, had, a, I'd say, an optimistic view of um, how science moves forward and the solutions that we have. Um, in medical school, you learn about all the drugs that exist. You really don't learn about all the drugs that don't exist or all the diseases that don't have options. And so you get a bit of a biased sense that that maybe we have drugs for all things and maybe we have figured out, you know, the big problems in medicine. But as a patient, I learned quite quickly that, that actually there are a number of diseases like idiopathic multicentric calcium disease that are very poorly understood and that there are few options. At the time, there were no FDA-approved drugs. And so all of a sudden, when you become a rare disease patient, um, you realize that there actually are a lot of other rare diseases out there. There's actually 30 million Americans have a a rare disease, and there are a total of 7,000 rare diseases. And so um, in medical school, there's no way that you can really touch on each one of those. There's just not enough days in medical school. So you kind of gloss over the the really rare ones. But, um, But you realize as a patient just how many diseases there are out there and what it's like when, when there are no options. In your incredible book, um, Chasing My Cure, uh, which um, I loved, you, you talk about a guiding principle that you start to live by, that you really started to live by. Think it, do it, you say. What does that mean to you? So when I nearly died for the first time, that first time I had my last rights read to me, I reflected on my life and I thought a lot about, uh, of course, I was in and out of consciousness, but but during the times where I was alert enough to think, I thought about the things that I had done and the things that I had said in my life. And I didn't actually regret anything that I had done or that I had said. The only things I regretted were things that I had not done or had not said, things that I would never be able to do, things that I'd never be able to say to the people that I love. And so as a result, I really decided that if I survive, if I get out of the hospital, I'm going to never talk myself out of doing something or saying something to someone that I care about. I'm always going to, if I think it and it's the right thing to do, I need to do it. Mm -hmm. And that really has informed the way that I live. And and if you hear that, you say, well, oh my gosh, that must mean that you do all these things. And, and, you know, isn't that kind of scatterbrained and and, and you lose focus? But I think it actually has helped me to focus because it's, it's meant that anything that I think about doing I really am evaluating, am I going to do it or not? And then start turning that thought into action and not letting there be so many ideas that maybe sit in the back of my head that I talk myself out of and I say, I can just do that later. You know, we have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm 25 years old, you know, at at least at the time I was 25 years old, you know, I've got all the time in the world and I'm trying to get into saying, you know, I'm 34 years old today, but I don't have all the time in the world. In fact, none of us do. And there's this other analogy that I like to use and thinking about life as being in overtime. I've considered myself in overtime ever since I had my last rights read to me. But the truth is, is we're actually all in overtime. You know, we all don't know how much time we have left. And we really do need to make the most of the time that we do have. In just a minute, we'll get back to today's show. But first, I want to share with you some exciting news. My new book, The Energy Clock, is hot off the press and available for pre-order now. Do you feel like you're always running low on energy? Do you find yourself giving your energy to the wrong people and the wrong things? Then pick up the energy clock and take control of your most important resource, your energy. In it, I show you how to start giving more of yourself to what's most important and how to stop wasting your time and resources on what's not. The energy clock hits stores on January 1 and you can pre-order it today. Visit TheEnergyClock.com for more information. Can you maybe tell us and and, and maybe share for our listeners a way that that has showed up in your life recently and how it's changed what you've done, right? Something that maybe you've thought you've done or 
or, or an experience in which you said, you know what, I'm in overtime here. I'm doing this. The first thing that comes to mind is something that I think a lot of listeners will, will certainly appreciate. Um, and, and that is how challenging it is in life to balance the things that, that are important to you. Um, all of us uh, have many things in our lives that are very important to us. I'm trying to figure out how do you spread your time between work and family and friends and, and your various hobbies and how do you I think that's probably one of the greatest challenges of life and um, for me that, that's a that's a real challenge between my my work which is trying to cure castle disease and my my family my, my wife and my, my daughter um, so thinking through uh, and just thinking recently um, a couple times I've been rushing back to the lab to, to work on an experiment or, or back to work to analyze some data um, and actually realizing that I could delay that just a little bit to spend a little bit more time with my daughter. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's, um, you know, I'm with my daughter, I'm spending time and having the most special time, but knowing that I, I do need to get back to the lab because if I if I want to spend a long time with her, if I want to be be here to watch her grow up, I need to continue to push forward the research and treatment for this disease. And so I think that, that immediately comes to mind because those are those points are through my mind just, just in the last few days. Well, and it's such an interesting thing that you're saying, right? Because when you're at work, you're helping yourself live longer so that you can be yes. a part of her life. But when you're with her, you're with her. And I know she's very young. How, that's a real juggling act. How do you uh, ensure that you sort of can look back and, and say, you know what, I did that right? Or I did my best. What is that? How does that show up for you? That's tough. It's really tough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause, you know, I, I don't know when this disease will come back. And if it comes back tomorrow uh, before I have another, another treatment approach to take, then, then I could certainly see myself regretting and saying, you know, I should have focused more time in the lab so I could spend longer uh, with my family. Um, but if it comes back later, then I think you could say, well, maybe I should have spent less time in the lab mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, sure. doing more of that time, you know, that, that I had with, with my with my family. So I, I think that it's tough. And in my, my life, I have this, you know, it's just, it's so abundantly clear that I'm in overtime and I can hear the clock ticking. But I do think that these are lessons that actually all of us, you know, we all need to need to struggle with a little bit and juggle a bit. Um, you know, how do we balance these things, even if it doesn't feel as extreme that, you know, this disease could come back any moment and I'm, I'm the, the kind of the person working to cure it. But I think that, I think all of us deal with, with similar sort of challenges with balance. Mm-hmm. Oh, no question. No question. Maybe not as acute, though, as yours, and you're just, just doing an incredible job. With each relapse that you've had, uh, which is five, what has kept you going, David? Like, did it get harder or easier each time? Did you get more motivated or, or, or less motivated each time? How, how did that work for you? It's a really good question. I think that with each of my relapses, I learned something different, and I think that I had a, a major takeaway from each one that helped me to overcome and survive. You know, these relapses, it's both surviving the relapse of the disease, but it's also trying to utilize that experience to try to make it so that that doesn't happen again. You know, what can I learn from that in the lab, in my samples, but also what can I learn from that just personally about, you know, how I can tackle this disease? And so I think that. I wouldn't say they got easier or harder. I think they, they, they got different with, with each of these relapses. My fourth relapse occurred. Um, so I mentioned the, the, the story where I was confused as a pregnant woman right around that time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was started on an experimental drug that um, the only drug to ever undergo a randomized control trial for Castleman disease. And we were so hopeful that this was going to be the treatment that would keep me in remission for a really long time. Um, but then, unfortunately, I, I came back to med school, and then I relapsed again on this drug, the only drug in development. It was kind of like it was the miracle we've been praying for, mm-hmm. and it didn't work for me. And that was when I, I guess I could have gone in two directions. I was told by my doctor that there were no drugs in development and that there were no promising leads, and there were no researchers out there doing work that were likely to turn into promising leads anytime soon. And so this could have been a period to focus on um, spending time with my family. My wife and I, uh, we just got engaged, you know, spending time with her. That that could have been one really important uh, way to handle it. The other was me realizing that if I didn't fight back, if I didn't try to dedicate my life to curing this disease, 
that I knew what my outcome would be. I would most certainly not survive very much longer. Um, and I knew that if I tried to dedicate my life, that I probably would not be able to have a material impact, but at least I would be able to have a chance and I could go out swinging. And so I had uh, this really important realization while my doctor was talking to me that if I hoped for a cure and if I hoped to spend time with my fiance and maybe one day have a family, I would need to turn that hope into action and that I couldn't just hope and pray for someone else somewhere to do it. So that's when I decided to dedicate my life to conducting Castleman's research, to creating a foundation to accelerate research worldwide, to try to identify treatments and cures for my disease. And so number four, that fourth relapse, really was critical for me in saying, you know, I need to turn my hope into action. Um, unfortunately, I, I would go on to, to relapse again, despite my best efforts to try to identify solutions. I relapsed again, um, but it was number five where I said, okay, with number four, I made this switch mentally that I would take on this disease. And number five, I'm actually going to dive into my data to mm -hmm. try to identify something that could help me. And um, and that's when I started searching for a drug that could maybe save my life. And tell our listeners about this story, because I think this is absolutely incredible. Sure. Um, so my fifth uh, flare occurred um, uh, shortly after finishing up medical school, and I nearly died for the fifth time. I spent a month hospitalized with critical condition. And fortunately, I survived thanks to chemotherapy, the same seven chemotherapies I've been given before. But at this stage, I was approaching my lifetime max of chemotherapy. I was running out of the ability to take any more of this thing that had saved my life before. And with each relapse, you have a high risk of, of dying. And so I could not continue to endure these these deadly relapses. And I, I dove into my data. I had been collecting samples on myself every month leading up to my last relapse. I had been uh, performing experiments on my samples. And when I got out of the hospital, I just dove into the data that I had. And I spent all day, every day, um, for weeks, trying to identify some sort of signal in the data that could identify a drug that maybe could help me. I, I was looking for a signal I could point to a drug that's already FDA approved for something else, regardless of what that drug may or may not be approved for. I thought if I could find something wrong in my samples and a drug that can target that thing, maybe it could work for me, whether or not it had been used for Castleman disease before. And from the data, I found a few patterns that made me think that this one particular part of the immune system, this pathway called the mTOR communication line, that maybe it was turned on and maybe if we turned it off, that that could be helpful for me. And fortunately, there is a drug that targets that particular communication line called serolimus. It was developed 25 years ago for kidney transplantation. It had never been used before for Castleman disease, but I was out of options. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't think it was necessarily going to work. I probably would have given it maybe a 10% likelihood that it would work, but I had no other options. So I decided to try it. And um, as, as we discussed before, it's now been over five and a half years that I've been in remission. And um, I don't like to say it's been almost six um, <laughs> because I don't know uh, what will come. I don't know if I'll relapse tomorrow. I don't know if I will make it to six years. Jan January 5th will mark six years. Um, but I also, you know, don't say it's been five years because I don't want to round down because my colleagues and I have worked really hard to identify this drug. And, and I should mention, earlier I mentioned I started a foundation. It's called the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network. And if it was just me working on this problem on my own, we would have never made all the progress that we've made. But but thanks to our team, we've been able to make a tremendous amount of progress, both for me, but also for the field in general. Um, when I was first diagnosed, there were no treatment guidelines, no FDA-approved drugs, no diagnostic criteria, no active research being done. All of these things meant that the field, the landscape was was really frightening to try to make progress in. But thanks to this network and thanks to the approach that we've taken to research, we've really been able to turn the tide against Castle disease, not just for me, uh, but for many other patients. Mm -hmm. And people can find out a little bit more on your website, right? That's right. They can go to cdcn.org. That's the Castleman Disease Collaborative Network, or they can go to chasingmycure.com. Those places can, can teach listeners about the work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And and though this drug is, is saving my life, and we think that through our work that we're able to help 
almost 50% of patients diagnosed with idiopathic multi center calcium disease compared to 0% before we set out on this journey. There's still another 50% still to go. Um, Castleman disease is a rare disease, but there are about 5,000 patients diagnosed each year with Castleman disease. So it's about as common as ALS. And of course, listeners will be very familiar with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. But Castleman's is about as common as ALS, but obviously much less awareness. And so one of the reasons that I wrote this book was to help to raise awareness about Castleman disease and the many other rare diseases out there. The other reason was because I learned so much about life and about living from nearly dying each of these five times lessons that I wish I didn't have to go through all that I went through to learn, but lessons that I want to share with the world so others don't have to go through um, all of these uh, these challenging experiences to learn them themselves. You know, I want to shift a little bit and talk about Chasing My Cure, your book. Um, is is such an incredible love story, uh, you know, kind of, of of your illness and how it's intertwined with your relationship with your now wife, yeah. Caitlin. And at the time of your initial diagnosis, you had been sort of out of the relationship, but then she came back into your life and ultimately, you know, has obviously become your wife. How did your understanding throughout that journey with her beside you for part of it during your illness, how did your understanding of love change throughout that process? Yeah, it's changed so much. Uh, as you said, Caitlin and I were, we had dated for several years before I got sick. We just happened to break up a few months before I became ill. And, um, when I became ill, I thought back as well about how when we had broken up, we really had this sense that you know we have all the time in the world. We're we're in our mid twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And all of a sudden, we're realizing that oh my gosh, my last few months on Earth, um, we could have been dating and could have been together, but instead, um, we were apart. And that that really, I think really led me to wanting to live live like I'm in over time and really um, follow that think it, do it motto. But it's just been so amazing because after I got out of the hospital, I spent almost six months hospitalized. And right around the time I was confused as a pregnant woman was when Caitlin came to visit me for the third time. The first two times she came to visit me, um, I was on my deathbed each time. And I didn't want her to see me like that. I didn't want that to be her, her lasting memory of me. And so I actually didn't let her um, come in the hospital room and see me. And my sisters didn't let her, her visit. Um, and so the third time she came to visit me, um, and she saw me, um, the way that I looked and she knew what I was going through. I was so afraid about, um, you know, if she would want to to date again. Um, but I also knew how I had been feeling and, and she shared that she'd been feeling the same way that, that she hated that we had, you know, kind of thought that we had all the time in the world that we, that we had, had stayed apart. And, and we decided to start dating again. My, my mom used to use the term unconditional love often. Um, that's how she would describe um, how she felt for me and my sisters. And, and I certainly could understand unconditional love for how I felt for my sisters and my dad and my mom. But watching Caitlin and how she really, really unconditionally loved me, despite the hurdles, despite my illness, despite me telling her she couldn't see me when I was going through all that I was going through, um, it helped me to get an even better sense for what unconditional love really means and how, you know, when you're a patient and you're in the hospital, it's really not just you in the hospital. It's, it's those people that you love that are in the hospital with you. And um, she has just not left my side and, and been so incredibly supportive um, as I've been battling Castleman disease as a patient, but also in my journey, taking it on as a physician scientist and just being the most incredible supporter, but also fighter. She's been you know, fighting alongside me this whole way. Well, and uh, you talk so much, and it's really just a beautiful love story, too, intertwined in your book um, about your relationship with Caitlin, which is so cool. And another important woman I know in your life is your mother, and I know you lost your mother to brain cancer um, when you were 18. You know, she taught you, and you talk about this, how she taught you, you know, to really create a silver lining um, yes. in, in things. How much of an impact has she had on the journey that you're on and the way you approach uh, each and every moment. Watching her life, um, I was uh, just always in awe of how she was just a supporter to everyone and how she was just such a good person, always thinking for what can she do to help other people. She felt like it was her responsibility um, to be there for others during tough times. So 
that was always so um, inspirational to me. But it was really in watching the way that she battled her illness and the way that she faced death so gracefully, um, but also with, with so much um, fight that I really maybe even learned more from her. And that was, as you mentioned and alluded to, this this concept of in life when we go through tough times, we're often encouraged to think about a silver lining that comes from something difficult. You know, it, my, my loved one experiences this, this, this illness, but at least this really positive thing came from mm-hmm. it. We're, we're encouraged to, to look for silver lining. But what my mom taught me was that in the midst of tough times, in the midst of storms, we shouldn't just look for silver linings. We should create silver linings. We should say, I'm going through a really tough thing or someone I love is going through a really tough thing. What can I do or what can I create that can make this a positive, can make it into something that actually is going to be positive for someone else? And so seeing the way that she did that in her illness, that was what motivated me to want to go into medicine, but also to want to start a foundation in her memory. Uh, when I was in college called AMF, her, her initials were Anne Marie Fagenbaum. And I started a group called AMF or actively moving forward for grieving college students. Mm-hmm, awesome. And that was a way to, to create something that would create this, this positive, this silver lining out of, out of my mom's illness and that her life could continue. And of course the fourth, it, it took me a while with Castleman disease for the first two and a half years, I just was fighting to survive, but it took that fourth time that I almost died to say, I can't just fight for my own survival. I need to fight back against this disease for all of those patients that are fighting this disease for all of our survivals. And that was really, in my mind, reflecting right back to to this idea of creating a silver lining. Castleman disease is awful. What it's done to me and to my family and so many other patients around the world has been awful, but let's let's turn this really awful experience into something positive by creating something that that can change lives. And and that's something that if if I didn't have the most incredible mom, if I didn't have have, have my mom, who I was so fortunate to have growing up and to learn from, then I never would have had the courage um, or the blueprint knowing that this is, this is how you do it. Mm, You, you continue to fight, you continue to face forward. I, I never could have. Wow. Wow. She sounds like an absolutely remarkable woman. She was. Wow. You know, you you have a line in the book that I highlighted. I love this line. You say, fear can paralyze, but that it can also focus. Fear can paralyze and it can also focus. Describe what you mean by that and how that's really showed up in your life. Yeah. So when um, I was first uh, diagnosed with this awful disease, um, I remember being absolutely terrified. I remember um, looking at the statistics on survival, the paper that was cited on Wikipedia said that about 5% of patients with my disease survived for two years after diagnosis and no one survived five years. Um, that was just hard to describe how frightening that was. Subsequent data, we've learned that about a third of patients will make it five years. Another third can make it to, to or sorry, a third of patients will pass away in the first five and another third will pass in the next five years after diagnosis. But that was terrifying. Mm-hmm. And knowing what I was up against was completely frightening. And, and it did kind of paralyze me early on. I, I wasn't focused on fighting the disease because it was so frightening that it was like, what progress can I really make? This disease has been was first described back in 1954, um, and and no progress has been made in the last 60 years. What could I actually mm-hmm. contribute to the fight against Castleman disease? Likely nothing, and and so it paralyzed me. That fear of failure, the fear of what I was going to be going up against, that made me say, you know what, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines. Um, but then you'd think I would have gotten even more scared when I learned that that there was there were no other drugs out there. There were no other promising leads. Mm-hmm. Um, but that fear, I don't know why. I don't know what was different about that fear. I think it was that I was different. I think it was, you know, it, it was the same fear as before, but this time I was different um, in that I decided that I was no longer just going to, to sit on the sidelines and hope that someone would do it. Um, I would turn that fear, I would use that fear uh, that I wouldn't be around for long, that I wouldn't be able to be there with my wife, Caitlin, or at the time, fiance, I wouldn't be able to have a family with her to focus me and saying, this is this is what I need to do. And everything else needs to fall off to the side. I mentioned earlier that 
I, I spend all of my time either doing my research for Castleman disease or spending time with my family. But my wife, Kaylin, and I had our, our first daughter 15 months ago, Amelia. Mm-hmm. And I, I really do that. I mean, I, I, my fear of the future and the fear of this disease has crystallized the focus to say, I need to spend my time with the people that I love and the work that I'm driven to do. Um, and, and really everything else um, needs to fall aside. Oh, it's remarkable. I mean, it's amazing. You you took, I, I love what you say, fear can paralyze or it can focus. And it sure as heck has focused you. And for <laughs> not just your own good, but you're helping so many others and continuing on this pursuit. You know, it's interesting to me because, you know, medicine is at some level so much about innovation, right? And yeah. But I know you've experienced a lot of frustration as you've navigated sort of chasing this cure. How would you say we should think differently about innovation, whether it's in medicine, right, or or, or any field? Yeah, I talk about this a lot in, in Chasing My Cure. It, you, you get the sense, or at least I had the sense before I really was in the, the research field that innovation um, kind of happens randomly and that it's just, people just have brilliant ideas and they just come to the top of mind and everything just kind of works out because you hear about the success stories. But what you don't hear about is that, you know, you don't see a headline that says today one million experiments failed to result <laughs> in any sort of breakthroughs. You just hear about right. the ones that do. And so all of a sudden when I when I became the patient and then I also was a physician scientist, I said, wait a minute, maybe we can't just like wait and hope that like some researcher somewhere is going to have this brilliant idea and he or she is going to then move it into a treatment that's going to save lives because that does happen. But a lot more often, nothing happens. No progress is made. No breakthroughs happen. No aha moments occur. And so right around the time that I was noticing this, I, I, re- I had enrolled in business school at Warden just down the street. And what I realized was that there are actually ways to promote and foster innovation in a very systematic way. It's to not just say, let's hope that the stars align and some researcher somewhere is going to come up with a solution. It's actually, let's bring together a community of people, of all of the people who, who may have important ideas. Let's crowdsource from those people about what work needs to be done. Let's prioritize the very best ideas and then let's go recruit the best people in the world to do that research. It's, it's very different to take this systematic approach than to say, I'm going to raise money and let's hope the right person applies for the right project at the right time. And this sort of systematic approach to innovation has been a complete game changer for Castleman disease. I mentioned earlier that that currently about one third to one half of patients with this awful disease are benefiting from the work that, that we've done. There's still work to do. There's you know, still the other half of patients that we are continuing to work towards. And, and we also know for the people that are benefiting, like myself, we don't know when we'll relapse next. So there's still work to be done even for us. But all that said, we've been able to make so much progress in the last several years through this approach. And if we had you know, just been following kind of the, the status quo of saying, well, innovation has to happen on its own time. Uh, you know, don't get in the way of innovation. Then, then we would still be waiting for, for a lot of the progress that we currently have. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so I have to ask you one last question. What have you learned about living from nearly dying? I learned a lot about mm-hmm. living from nearly <laughs> dying. I'm a very different person today mm. than I was about nine years ago when I first became ill. I think the, the first thing that's really that we talked about a bit um, that's really crystal clear is this concept that we're all in overtime. Mm-hmm. And that before I got sick, I didn't live like I was in overtime. I lived like I had all the time in the world. Um, but now I live like I'm in overtime. And we're all in overtime. You know, we all have a limited amount of time. We don't know how long that's going to be. And we need to make the most of every moment. And, and if we're going to be in overtime, I think we should live with this think it do it mentality that if you think you're doing something and it's worth doing, I'm not saying think a bad right. idea and then do a bad idea. But if it's a good <laughs> idea and it's worth doing, don't talk yourself out of doing it. Another is is to turn hope into action. That is really the theme. The, the main theme of, of my book, Chasing My Fear, is really about hope and how, as we said earlier, hope and fear can paralyze, they can focus, hope can be powerful, but it can actually, hope can also sometimes slow us down from taking action. Believing that someone somewhere will figure out something for us can sometimes make us say, well, okay, well, maybe I don't need to do anything about it. I can kind of just 
sit back and wait for that person somewhere to figure it out for me. And so I think realizing that if it's something that's worthy of my hope, if it's worthy of my prayers, then it needs to be worthy of my action. And I need to, I need to drive action based on what I'm hoping for and praying for something that I think is, is, is maybe a simple concept, but I didn't get that until I was in the hospital and until I was nearly dying. And that's something that I really want to share with the world. And I want others to, to reflect on what they hope for, reflect on what they pray for, turn those hopes into action. Another one we talked about was silver linings and creating silver linings in the midst of really, really tough times. And one of the, the many others, maybe the last one I'll mention, although there are many other uh, life lessons, because like I said, you learn a lot about life from nearly dying five times. The last one I, w- I would close with is that sometimes solutions are hiding in plain sight. You know, we think that we maybe uh, have uh, I have figured out the right drugs for the, for the right diseases, but actually the drug that I'm on, as I mentioned earlier, was developed 25 years ago for another disease. How many other drugs are there out there that are just waiting at the nearby pharmacy of a patient with a deadly illness that we just don't even know to try yet? And, and even beyond medicine, how many other solutions like that are already out there that are available, you know, at your nearby store um, that could be the solution that, that could be life saving. And so, I think I always knew that to to be factually correct before I got ill. But now that I've gone through what I've gone through and I've realized the downside and the risk of not leveraging all of these solutions hiding in plain sight, it's made me work so hard to try to say, well, what could be out there? And can we get our hands on it? And can we start helping people today instead of hoping that it just kind of randomly emerges in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, and when you say in plain sight, what's so powerful about that is your solution was inside of you. Right. So talk about plain sight. Wow. That's incredible. I, I guess I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. I think about it as the drug being the solution. Uh-huh. That's right. It was, um, it was the family supporting me. It was the people around me. It was my mom's, uh, my mom's teaching, um, that all led to, um, to being able to figure out the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Well, creating that hope inside of you and creating yes. that silver lining inside of you. So talk about plain sight. Yeah. Well, <laughs> So, David, where can folks find, you know, Chasing My Cure, of course, and, and, and learn more about you and ways that we can support Castleman's disease? Sure. So Chasing My Cure is available everywhere books are sold, Amazon, your, your favorite local bookstore, and everywhere in between. You can also learn about Chasing My Cure by going to our website, chasingmycure.com. There you can learn about this journey, but you can also learn about Castleman disease and the work that we're doing, which is really a model for disease research. You can also check out cdcn.org to see if maybe there's a way that you want to support our work and help us to cure Castleman disease. So I can be here a long time to, to be with my daughter and so many other patients can achieve so many important milestones, but also so that our work can have a really important impact for many, many other diseases. That's awesome, David. Thank you for that. That's terrific. We always end with rapid fire, so I'm going to hit you with some quick questions and you just fire back what comes up. Sure. So one word to describe yourself. Focused. One word others would use to describe you. Mission-driven. Mission-driven. Last book you read. Grit. (laughs) And Angela Duckworth, of course, endorsed your book. She's been a guest on our show. She's a remarkable woman. What's a guilty pleasure you have, David? I love just sitting and doing absolutely nothing with my (laughs) sweet daughter, Amelia. And it just, time can fly by, and I just Mm. love every minute of it. That's awesome. That's awesome. A habit that has improved your life? Turning every idea, every big picture idea, into a list of tangible to-dos that could get done one at a time to take what feels like a mountain and turning it into into a very clear and actual checklist that I can get started doing today and not worry about um, it being too big to have to put off for the future. Mm. What's your biggest fear? That I won't be around long enough to uh, to watch my, my daughter grow up and that, that the progress I'm making in the work I'm doing for Castleman disease won't be enough in time. So I try to use that to to drive my, my daily efforts. Mm-hmm. Well, I know through this podcast there'll be a lot more people praying for you. What is some advice, David, you would give your younger self? I think 
to keep running full speed, even if you're going to run into a lot of dead ends and you're going to run the wrong way um, after a lot of problems. But mm. just keep running full speed because running the wrong direction and running into dead ends is going to teach you um, how to run and how to achieve solutions, even though it's going to be really tough. Yeah. Just keep running. Sure, sure. Yeah, no is just feedback, I always try to say. <laughs> I like that. So one last question for you. What game changer inspires you and why? I would say my father-in-law, um, mm. Bernie, this is Caitlin's father, uh, has been so good in his life about balancing work, life, nonprofit service, and that balance, I think, is something that we've talked about already on the show. That balance, I think, is is really the key to life, finding that, that balance. And so he inspires me. He, and he fortunately also helps me with trying to find the balance in my life. And, and that's been you know, a real game changer for me as I, as I try to spend every moment like I'm in overtime. Mm -hmm. oh. David, thanks so much for, for coming on the show. Thanks for the work that you do for the lives, certainly that you're changing and and for fighting to stay here on this earth because you're making um, a lot of change and a lot of incredible impact. So thanks so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.